Spider-Man 2 destroys its hero. A movie that's garnered high praise from critics, even won an Oscar, and has been on every YouTuber superhero top 10 list. I remember watching this movie for the first time when I was 7 years old, and I can proudly say I still love this movie to death. This right here is my favorite thing. Back then, I fell in love with Spider-Man because of the incredible special effects. And of course, Tobey Maguire. After numerous rewatches though, what's tricking me most as I've gotten older is the excellent character analysis Sam Raimi created with Peter Parker. I never entirely understood understood what sacrifice and choice meant for Peter when I was a child, but I've resonated with Peter much more as I've grown older, realizing he isn't just some superhero with tremendous powers, but a layered man struggling against personal issues. In this delicious take, I talk about how Sam Raimi created the pinnacle character piece on Peter Parker, using anxiety and depression to develop his struggles of being the titular superhero we all love. At the film's beginning, we see how Peter deals with his decisions of the first movie. His actions that led to Norman Osborn's death still weigh heavily on Harry, leaving their relationship strained. Peter longs to rekindle his relationship with Mary Jane, but chooses not to, because then she would be in the risk of danger. Peter sums it up perfectly with these few words. If she only knew how I felt about her, but she can never know. I made a choice once to live a life of responsibility, a life she can never be a part of. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man, given a job to do. His priority to be Spider-Man and help those around him overtake his abilities to hold a stable job. He gets fired from Joe's Pizza and only makes a measly 200 bucks being a part-time photographer. A fact I'm very proud of. He cannot give himself the perfect apartment, even though it has the sickest view ever. Like, come on, Peter, are you really that poor? In this movie, sacrifice plays a massive role in Peter's life. He can't make time for class, show up to Mary Jane's play, pay rent on time, or give the people he loves the most the time of day. His inner struggle between what he wants and his responsibilities leave him pondering whether it's it's worth it or not to be the hero. And this is where his anxiety and identity crisis catalyze. A common symptom of identity crisis syndrome is questioning your value or self-worth. And Peter questions his self-worth a lot, especially since he thinks being Spider-Man provides more value than being Peter. And because of this, Peter starts losing his powers. He wants to be with the girl he loves and be that average guy, but he is unsteady because all he's done is follow Uncle Ben's words, never considering what he wants. Sam Raimi constructs a personal script that many audience members can see in themselves. When you see your hero struggle and immensely like Peter throughout the movie, you feel a sense of personal connection. When you see that a superhero faces anxiety and a lost sense of direction, you realize that heroes can be human like us too. Any audience member watching has been through some sort of anxiety or depression or a sad time in their life. Because of this, it makes them more engaged with Peter's struggles. When they see Peter stumble and lose his way, they become super attached and want to root for the hero to come back stronger. This is why Sam Raimi and writer Alvin Sargent do a phenomenal job at humanizing Spider-Man by stripping him down and making him suffer. Offer. Peter can't catch a break throughout the entire scene. His sacrifices have taken their toll, and Peter is pushed to his limit. First, Peter tries to console his best friend, Harry Osborn. Since the relationship has been fractured and Harry abuses alcohol, Harry's emotions overcome him, and he publicly humiliates Peter in front of everyone at the party. Sam Raimi and Alvin Sargent take Harry's struggles and build them up subtly from the movie's beginning. We see his inner angst with Peter for not revealing who Spider-Man is, and we see how he feels humiliated by being saved by him at Auto Showcase. It's these small emotional beats that Sam and Alvin used to ramp up Harry's angst at the party. Harry's abuse of alcohol makes him vulnerable to his emotions, and it's no wonder that he takes it out on Peter because, as an audience member, we understand why he's doing it. Hi, brother. With Mary Jane, we see what Peter's actions have done to her well-being, complicating her emotions and how she feels. Throughout the movie until this point, Mary Jane feels this tension between her and Peter, and she knows something is not being said. She realizes she must leave her relationship with Peter in order to move on from the uncertainty. For her, that's marrying John. For Peter, that means losing the woman he loves the most. This scene is the tipping point for Peter's identity crisis and depression, because Sam Raimi takes his hero and strips him away from everything he holds dear to him. His friendship is ruined. He's forced to watch the woman he loves get engaged to another man, and the cherry on top is that he can't get a single thing to eat or drink or get the right photo. A common symptom of depression is a lack of sleep, and Peter admits that he can't sleep anymore without having bad dreams. His diagnosis from his doctor confirms his mental problems, but also gives him the idea to let go of his Spider-Man identity altogether. The dream sequence is written so well because it takes Peter's feelings and turns them into actual words between two people. Uncle Ben is Peter's Spider-Man identity, and Peter is his true identity. He's been beaten down to his absolute lowest by being Spider-Man, 
hasn't brought him any sense of peace. Uncle Ben hits Peter with those famous lines. With great power comes great responsibility. While Peter doesn't want to be that guy anymore, he's Spider-Man. No more. Raindrops are falling on my head. And just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed, nothing seems to fit. The raindrop scene may look like the best time of Peter's life, and it may seem that way because he can get to class, see Mary Jane's play, and spend more time with Aunt May, but in reality, it keeps him from doing the one thing he loved the most, and that's helping those that couldn't fight for themselves. See, Spider-Man disappearing is just another selfish act Peter must learn from, and Sam Raimi uses that for Peter to move the character forward and make the choice that Spider-Man is the path he must follow. Saving the child in the burning building gave him that sense of responsibility he learned about from the first movie. Still, some poor soul got trapped on the fourth floor, never made it out. If he had his powers, he could have done more, and he could have saved everyone. When confronted with Aunt May, she inspires him to embrace the identity of Spider-Man because his encouragement to the people of New York to be their best selves gives them hope. I believe Sam Raimi wrote this to build up our hero and is a complete antithesis to Green Goblin's speech in the first movie. The one thing they love more than a hero is to see a hero fail, fall, die trying. In spite of everything you've done for them, eventually they will hate you. Why bother? While Aunt May turns it around by saying, Everybody loves a hero. People line up for them, cheer them, scream their names, and years later they'll tell how they stood in the rain for hours just to get a glimpse of the one who taught him to hold on a second longer. And although Aunt May gives him the passion to try and become Spider-Man again, it is not until pressured by losing the girl he loves the most that it dawns on him that he needs to choose to be Spider-Man and have that strong focus on what I want. See, his powers don't define who he is, but amplify his strengths, which are his love for the closest people in his life and helping others who have had a hard time fighting for themselves. It's through this complete journey of discovery that we as an audience jump for joy when Spider-Man returns for the climactic battle against Doc Ock, because we journeyed with him through his lowest of lows. In my Superman video, I brought up how this scene is so good, yes, because it has amazing special effects, but it also has a purpose. Peter needs to get MJ back, and he'll do whatever it takes to do that because we have seen how much Peter loves MJ through his interactions with her at his birthday party, or when he tells her that he wants to do Spider-Man, but he can't because then she would be in danger. Through these interactions, it makes the audience jump for joy when we see Peter go after Doc Ock because we want to get her back ourselves. And this is why the film works. This is why Sam Raimi used anxiety to build up our hero, because giving our hero something relatable to the audience allowed us to feel his pain. His struggle to battle multiple things at once while doing his job to save the city is something admirable most audience members have respect for. When Sam starts to bring Peter back to action, it's his choice to come back. Not out of respect for Uncle Ben anymore, but it's the choice for the city and his own. Peter realizes Spider-Man is a burden he has to live with, and it's his choice to give up the things he wants the most, even his dreams. And although that involves leaving Mary Jane, it's also Mary Jane's choice to take that leap with him. That is why the movie concludes with Peter being Spider-Man and Mary Jane leaving John to be with Peter. Sam Raimi wrote the most emotionally moving superhero movie of its time, and it's clear his heart and soul went into writing something with substance and respect for the character. Seeing a hero this relatable and down to earth is groundbreaking. It's noticeable that adaptations of superheroes on the big screen will no longer be one to one, but nowadays studios don't even try to make something of substance, but more formulaic nostalgia bait. With Spider-Man 2, it's not a direct adaptation of the comics. Still, keeps the character's spirit intact by exploring newfound personal issues like his anxiety and depression revolving around his sacrifices and choices. It's sad to see superhero movies lose this sense of relatability nowadays, making every obstacle something world-ending or universe-bending instead of focusing solely on the hero and their personal issues. I think the closest we've seen superheroes talk about personal matters this in-depth is Netflix's Daredevil, Dark Knight Trilogy, and Logan. Sam Raimi and Alvin Sargent deserve all the credit in the world because they captured the essence of Spider-Man in a way that hasn't been caught in 20 years, and it's no surprise that it remains one of the best superhero movies, and for some, movies in general. Thanks for watching this video, I had a blast making it. Spider-Man 2 is definitely one of my favorite movies of all time because this movie has been so special to me for so long. Let me know down below if you like these longer form content videos and I would love to make more. With that being said, if you like this video, subscribe, hit the like button, and I'll see you in the future with another video essay in the coming weeks. Peace out.